Hey, Brad, the uh, decoration's still up, huh? It's a very important trophy hanging from your, uh, you from your mirror that? over there. No, I love that the festive spirit lives within you still. I invite you into my home. Yeah. And you come in here and you pass judgment on my decorating preferences. Look, look I've talked up your light choice a lot. That's true. I have, I have given a lot of people reasons to burn. I'm probably responsible for at least <laughs> five or ten tons of carbon dioxide in the air. Tens of dollars of wasted electricity. Yeah, from, from encouraging people to go back to incandescent Christmas tree lights. I mean, uh, at the time of this recording, the 12 days of Christmas only ended two days, three days ago? Wait, did the 12 days of Christmas start on Christmas or before yeah, Christmas? Yeah, they run through January 5th. What? Is technically the last of the days of Christmas. How did I never know this? Yeah, so, I mean, I feel like up through the 5th, your anything goes as far as decorations, but I mean, where are you guys at? The, the Gina took the ornaments off yesterday. She's okay. taken apart all of the Christmas-themed Lego. Okay. You We're, still have remnants, though? The Chris, the lights are still on the outside of the house because the weather's been too crappy oh. for me to go out and take them off. So I'm uh, I'm in a game of Christmas tree chicken with an apartment across the way. Oh, yeah. Behind the building here. They still have theirs up? They've got a full-size, like, you know, six, seven-foot yeah. blinking colored lights. The whole works. There's a still up. So as long as that tree is still up, I think I'm okay. Uh, I was at the tested office in the mission the other day and we went to lunch and walking through the mission. Oh, it's just, I bet it's just a graveyard. It's great because like everywhere you walk, you're brushing up against old Christmas trees and it smells terrific. Uh, yeah. That kind of sad to me though. It really, okay. just seeing them just laying there bare naked on the, on the sidewalk. Look, look, part of the Buddhist practice is acknowledging that death is a part of life. That's and, fair. And, uh, you have to learn to let go. Yeah. You have yeah, the time is done. It's, it's the time has passed. You ever burn a Christmas tree? Yeah, I mean, that's what we used to do exclusively. Yeah, exactly. That's the side. We'd go out in the backfield. Yeah. We'd use that to start the, the, the junk pile. Uh-huh. Look, I grew up in the country, so when we had shit that we needed to get rid of, yep. we didn't take it to the dump. <laughs> we just had a hole back in the back that like we'd tractored all the dirt away, the, the, the burnable stuff away from. My girlfriend had never... She didn't know how flammable a Christmas tree truly is because she'd never seen one burn before. I was like, you have no idea. Oh, yeah. It's, it's like it's, gasoline. I, like, I, the thing explodes. What is it? Is it steel wool? I think we used to use steel wool, like not an SOS pad, but steel wool without um, soap on it, like a, just a plain steel wool. And you pull it apart a little bit and sp- spark some magnesium in there and then hit it with a spark. And it's just like it explodes. Like Christmas a, trees go up faster than that. It's just like a bomb in your living room. <laughs> Hey, Brad. Hi, Will. Welcome to Brad and Will Made a Tech Pod. Let's make a tech pod. It's the number one tech podcast by two guys who sit around and talk about one thing once a week. In sweats of various types. And sometimes take questions. Yep. Uh, this Not week, this week, though. This week's topic. Uh, we're going to talk about the how real the stuff we saw at CES is. Uh, the tidings of the new year. Yes. The Consumer Electronics Show is upon us. Let me go ahead and tell you, there is nothing that makes me happier. But the, than, can, I, can I stop you? Can yeah, I guess? Yeah. Go ahead. Not having to annually go to CES? Like, I don't mind Vegas... Although we used to go for like 10 days, Ooh, which was a lot. Just, I was gonna, yeah, like, that's a wow. Are you kidding? Yeah, well, when we, when we drove, when we were in the whiskey basement, we would go, we would take the van. We would load up everybody's spare in the office, yeah. as many people as we could fit into the van. And then we'd drive 11 hours to Vegas. Was there really 10 days worth of stuff to do at CES? Oh, the, no, the problem is everybody gloms onto the beginning and end of it. So there's like oh, sure. drone yeah. stuff out in the desert three days before. <laughs> and then there's two days of press conferences. And then there's three days of show. And yeah. then you're like, I just want to die. Like I've, I've been to, even the game industry used to have plenty of, yeah, yeah, Vegas yeah. press events, and I definitely decided that like seventy-two hours is the absolute limit. So there's three things that are important. There's three Vegas rules for me. One is that you don't stay in a casino that you have to, you don't stay in a hotel that you have to walk through a casino to get to your hotel room. Can't it, does that exist? Yes, it wow. definitely exists. So okay. like uh, Planet Hollywood, what used to be the Planet Hollywood Towers, and I think is now the Hilton. There's okay. no casino. You just really? walk. There's like four slot machines, but you can walk straight in from the door. Yeah. go up an elevator and be in your. I mean, you your, can't even get through the Vegas airport without being <laughs> no. You bombarded in the face with yeah. Well, but, but the nice thing about that is you don't have to walk through cigarette smoke necessarily. Okay. to get through, you, you don't have to walk through thick cigarette cigarette smoke <laughs> to get to your hotel room. Sure. Um, two. I don't drink when I'm in Vegas, okay. which it turns out makes Vegas much more tolerable because mm-hmm. you're you're tired and you feel shitty and you feel kind of gross all the time. But sure. at least you don't have a hangover. Yeah. Um, and then the third one is uh, eat eat vegetables. Like eat good food. Like if you eat Vegas food the whole time, you'll die. Bad news. Yeah. It's I I the first year we went to Vegas and stayed for seven days. It tested. I think I gained like 14 pounds. <laughs> 
two pounds a day. It was pretty good. Those pretty buffets, good work. Those buffets never stop. Yeah, no. Um, and and then after you you know after you do that, like if you do that and you like try to sleep, even when we were sleeping like three four hours a night, it was it was okay. Got to take care of yourself. I don't I don't miss going to CES well, I, though. Well, I haven't been in God probably oh seven was the last time I went. Yeah. Why do they insist on having it the first week of the year? Like, because it's, it's cheap, really. Yeah, the con- convention space is really nobody yeah. wants to have a convention. Quarter of a million people come there, or isn't used it, to. Isn't the tech industry incredibly wealthy at this point? They well, just... you, you don't get wealthy by spending <laughs> pissing away money on prime, <laughs> having prime a convention center tech space. conference in yeah. July. Um. So yeah, uh, over the years, CS kind of changed though from consumer electronics to computer. For a while, it was all computer stuff and car stuff, and now it's just like anything goes, man. Mm-hmm. There's like there's oh yeah e e cigarette vape business yeah, happening vape, there vape juice and and there's TV, sex toys TV stuff and sex toys and oh, sorry sorry sexual wellness food? devices food because um, food is tech now well I everything mean, is tech food is tech uh, there's car stuff there's more car stuff now there's self driving cars it used to be it was just like car it was like subwoofers for your car yeah I mean now, you know we we are experiencing global techification of everything right so. Oh God, we're I doomed! Guess, like anything, could, machine learning stuff's there. I guess any, anything could be at CES because everything is tech. I remember one year I went and and every single like tiny booth you went into had an ebook reader, like with an e ink screen. Hmm. I was like, man, these things. How many people are buying these books that have no store attached only to read pirated ebooks? Turns out a lot of people. <laughs> Those yeah. books are pretty small. Who knew? Um, but yeah, so there have actually been. The wire cutter used to joke that there was like one article worth of things to do to talk about that came out of CS that were real and good. Yeah. Uh, and they would go and make one. It was a pretty long article. It was like one. <laughs> they would send 20 people and make one article, which okay. I thought was hilarious. Um, but this year, there have been a couple of things that are actually impactful and that probably we'll have to talk about in the future because I don't think we want to dig in all the way on them today. Uh, but like Bluetooth, Bluetooth LE audio. Is that uh, in your mind? Is that the thing? Is that the big the biggest, I, the biggest news out of here, or it certainly seems like maybe the most actionable or relevant news. I think it's the most real. It's the thing that's going to affect people soonest, yeah. probably. Okay, like it won't be on the phones that you have now, currently, probably. So it's not. It's not. A, it's not going to be backwards compatible. This is not going to be a firmware update. It'll be backwards be, compatible, but it won't be. Or, a I'm sorry. Firmware update. I, yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. It can't be enabled in existing I, phones. I, it doesn't seem like it. It's okay. un, that's unclear to me. I, don't, I, I I could be wrong. It seems like it's something that when we get the next gen of SOCs on phones and the next gen of the embedded chips that make Bluetooth headsets work, it, it like Bluetooth headphones work rather. It's it's the thing that's going to do that is what it seemed like to me. Okay. Um, but then there's some other stuff too, like AMD announced an enormous 64 core Threadripper, yep. which 128 logical cores. Yeah, it's it's. I mean, look, it's a four thousand dollar processor. Yeah, it's not for us. No, but but you can buy. It's we talked about chiplets last week. Mm-hmm. That's and a it's, lot of chiplets. It's a lot of chiplets. <laughs> Holy crap! Yeah, we'll just do a quick overview here. We've got 360 hertz screens. We've got impossible pork. Yeah. Uh, that, so unicellular grown pork products. I don't know if they're unicellular. Yes. So they were talking. One of the things they that came out of the impossible. Are there, are, there, are there grades of impossible meat? Well, I don't know. It's all the same. Okay. It's how they like they shape it and how you shape it and stuff like that. One, one of the um, have you cooked with that stuff at all? No, yet? I've never tried it. Oh, so it's I'm interesting that I had a I've had a Whopper and I feel like I had a burger at uh, Chardonnay before that shut down. Huh. Um, are they doing the Whopper everywhere? The Whopper's everywhere now. Like literally you every could go to a Burger King there, I could get to a Burger King. Maybe I should just go try that. I mean, look, we could take a break between the podcast. Go get an impossible. Um, I'm not recording any more podcasts after Burger King. <laughs> this is a this is a pre Burger King podcast. I, I had my first uh, fast food cheeseburger of the year on the way over here because oh, yeah? I hadn't eaten yet. What, so who got the honor? I, I went to Wendy's. It's okay. the it's the I find it's the best mix of decent fries and decent burger. Did you do the junior bacon cheeseburger. I went I went with this awesome uh, bacon cheeseburger that has like it has like some sort of slightly spicy mayonnaise on it. It's like a okay. sauced up aioli and some tomatoes. Sounds it's a pretty fancy. good burger. Yeah, pretty good burger. I always thought of Wendy's as the fancy burger. They're square. Yeah. Yeah. You don't you don't go to Wendy's. You you know, you go to Wendy's for a three course. You get yes. like your burger, your yes. fries, cup of, and then a frosty afterwards. Cup of chili. Yeah. Yeah. Baked potato. You like Wendy's? Oh, yeah. Baked potato and chili. I would uh-huh. just go get baked potato and chili for lunch sometimes That's when I when I work next to a Wendy's. Lunch of Kings. Um Yeah, so the Impos- Impossible announced pork. Mm-hmm. Um, and then they were talking about how they feel like a lot of the meat protein products we eat are going to be based on unicellular life, not multicellular life. Oh, that's what you meant. In okay. the future. Okay. Yeah. Um, Such as 
like they grow bacteria and yeast. Fung- fungus and yeast and stuff yeah. that is engineered to produce similar nutrition and flavor and texture and then form it into pieces that look like the impossible stuff looks like beef. I think I will take that over insect based food. I've eaten insect based food. Well, it's I've, fine. Had, I've had it. It's, yeah. you know, it's certainly edible. It's just not necessarily very appetizing. The cricket flour. Like the so like, I didn't have anything that was broken down to the to the, that extent. Oh, to the extent that it actually resembled like existing food products. Yeah, this was more like here are some fried crickets. The cricket flour. Here, are, here here's a hot dog with some mealworms on it. Man, the cricket flour has a really lovely taste. It's um it's it's uh like I had chocolate chip cookies made with it. Oh wow! And probably wouldn't have realized that they were made with anything. No like kidding. They were better than a lot of the non gluten flour alternatives. Okay. So yeah, like once once it's processed to the point that it resembles everyday food, I think I'd probably be fine with it. But. Yeah, and the nice thing is like you know when you're in your bunker, you can grow enough crickets to support your family of four <laughs> in like right. a four by four box. They're very green. Yeah, it turns out. All right, so are we doing pork now? Do you want to? Just... I mean, we want to just jump. Uh, yeah, I don't. I don't know what to do here. This is, there, we don't, like, I, I, this I isn't a roundup podcast. How do we do this? I don't know. <laughs> well, we're talking about the pork, so let's finish the pork. Okay. Um, but I read about it, and like, I really the gist of the story I read was, hey, they announced Impossible Pork. Like, there wasn't a lot of other detail there in terms of like how it's being made or how it's differentiated, other than it tastes like pork. Yeah. Yeah. So it's uh, ground pork and sausage. Mm. So presumably now you can make an Impossible Meatloaf because you need pork oh, and yeah. sauce and yeah. and beef to do meatloaf. Yeah. Um, but like if you, th- it looks like they're going down the most first, the easiest targets, so like ground beef, pe- Americans eat a ton of ground beef, yes. Americans eat a ton of ground pork yeah. in terms of sausage and, and stuff like that. What I did not know, uh, looking into this is that according to the UN, pork is the most consumed protein in the world. Cause of Asia. Yeah. Yeah. I still would have guessed it was chicken. Yeah. I don't think, oh, I, don't wow, think really? I don't think chicken's even number two, actually. Wow. We killed a trillion. We've gotten so much weird chicken yeah. mail lately, by the way. Right. We met. We talk about chicken farming one time, <laughs> yep. and um, the global fossil layer of chicken bones. Yeah, the um, the 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 avian the avian age. Uh, but yeah, I didn't I didn't realize pork was the predominant meat in Asia, and you know, obviously, like Impossible wants to expand into China, so pork is an obvious next step. Yeah. Um, but do you think do you think the genesis of this is the same as the beef, and then at some point in the production process, did they differentiate I, the texture and the flavor somehow? I mean, the texture is kind of if you think about ground pork versus ground beef, the texture is similar. Um, a I lot of the so. texture on the impossible stuff comes with how you cook it. Ah. So when we've tried it at home, you ha- it doesn't have fat. Like unlike normal beef, it doesn't have the ground beef doesn't have fat. OK, so you have to like you have to use oil or butter or olive oil or, or some add some fat yourself. Oh, I didn't know that. Um, or else it doesn't brown properly because okay. you need that. That fat helps the Maillard reaction. It gets hot enough that the Maillard oh, reaction can happen. Maillard reaction again. We love the Maillard reaction here. Um, so, yeah, I'm interested in trying it. I, I feel like like breakfast sausages mm-hmm. are a good place to start with that. Sure. And they, they're selling. It seems like they're going to sell a sausage <gasps> version and a just plain ground pork version. OK, the so, ultimate litmus test for this stuff. Yeah. Can you make good white sausage gravy with it? I can't imagine you. you could you, could you I, can you make can you make proper biscuits and gravy with this impossible? So here's my secret shame. Most pork sausage that you get now does not have a high enough fat content because most American pork is low fat. Huh. So I almost always add lard even really? to the ground, even to pork the fat. Good old Jimmy Dean. Unless I do. A, well, so we do the Jimmy Green Dean organic. Oh, um, just because it's less salty. <laughs> like the Jimmy Dean straight is so salty. I can't eat it. I didn't think I would ever hear the phrase Jimmy Dean organic. In it's, my life. it's ludicrous, right? <laughs> it sounds like an oxymoron, um, but it's it's uh, it's much lower salt. So it's not like I like when I'm back east. Mm-hmm. Tennessee, Tennessee pride mm-hmm. is the sausage of choice. Oh, really? Yeah. It's, okay. it's a classic Tennessee brand. So we, we did. We didn't have a local brand. We. Oh, you just did Jimmy Dean. We just went with the old JD. Hey man, that's it was hard when I moved here because they didn't have JD. But yeah. the 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 JD organic is, I think, better than Tennessee Pride. Interesting. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, you're gonna have to add a lot of fat. Okay. You could use butter though. I yeah. mean, I guess butter is not gonna be vegetarian, but it'll be not gonna be vegan, but it'll still be vegetarian. Sure. Um. So yeah, impossible pork. Yep, that's happening. Um. Should we? Ju- you want to? You want to save the Bluetooth stuff for the end, or you want to jump right in? No, and get, just get to get, it. I mean, that's the thing. Yeah. We have the most bullet points on here, so let's yeah get into it. So what? What is what is Bluetooth LE? I guess the LE audio. stands for low energy. That sounds right. Um, I there are multiple components to this, and I have had a little bit of trouble uh, separating them out. Well, it's like because a I network stack because there's right. like a hardware layer, and then there's a yeah. So uh, I think at the at the bottom is the LE, which is the signal. Yeah, it's a specific type of signal. Um. So they're using that for audio now. And then within that, there is a new codec called LC3, which is lower, higher quality, lower bit rate. 
that's what that's how they're pitching it. Okay. Uh, so from the sound of it, this is going to be kind of the new baseline Bluetooth audio standard because all the comparisons I've seen out there have been against SBC, which is the old, like that's the lowest common denominator Bluetooth standard, right? Like yeah, that's the one that everybody supports. That, that's the one that like worked your old Bluetooth headset right. 15 years ago. Right. So like if you've got AirPods, they do better than that. If you've got like, I don't know, you know, like Qualcomm's got their AptX stuff, which is higher quality than mm-hmm. that. But SBC is the one that any cheapo $20 off the, off the shelf. And is SB- headphones is going to support, I believe. OK, I, I just <laughs> in my defense detail, like like un, untangling the mess of bluetooth audio codecs is very difficult reading through how this works made it really clear to me that we need to do a whole bluetooth how bluetooth yeah. audio work like, like there's a lot there like at, at, a, at a real high level there's a weird thing with bluetooth audio where when you're using your phone and like plugging it like in the old days when your phone had a headphone jack you would plug the phone in and the there'd be a digital to audio analog converter a dac on the phone, the phone right. that would basically turn the digital signal, the digital slices of into the a, of the audio signal just into an electrical into a signal, wave. Right, yeah, that goes up the, the cord. Yeah, and now that lives on the Bluetooth headset, right, uh, behind the radio. Yeah. And there's like a network pipe essentially that runs over Bluetooth. Bluetooth has a, has a kind of low bit rate. I don't know what it is now on modern Bluetooth. I should look that up. But um, but anyway, okay. So so there's new there's a new pipe. There's a new codec that lives inside that pipe. Mm-hmm. Presumably, people can continue using whatever codecs they were using before. I guess so. Whether it's SBC or <laughs> AAC or Aptex. Yeah, but it sounds like LC3. This new codec is going to give you better sound quality at the same or low bit rates. Uh, the thing that, good. the thing that was interesting to me about this is that it's multiple independent synchronized streams. So that uh, yeah, in terms of like usability, that seems like the thing that actually matters the most. I hadn't considered this, but I mean, it, it makes perfect intuitive sense that. Uh, current true wireless earbuds, you know, the, the, the yeah, the AirPod style, you know, yeah. the, are essentially only connecting one of those to the phone and then it's shooting a beam <laughs> straight, straight through your, your brain. Head, well, that's straight great. through your brain to the other ear. That sounds terrific. Like, I mean, the, when I say that makes intuitive sense, like there's no other way that could work, right? Well, but I never actually stopped to consider, oh my God, these headphones are just beaming the audio straight through the prob- skull of everyone fine. using them. Yeah, I mean, whatever. It's low energy radio waves. It's not. Yeah, it's uh, multiple. As far as we know. No, no, no. This isn't as far. There's been there's been no, multiple. I know, I know, I know. There's been tons, know, there's been tons and tons of studies. You got to be careful because the chemtrails people are yes, out there. Yes, I know. Oh, um, dude, forget the chemtrails people. The Wi-Fi people are out there. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> the cover your house in tinfoil. The, the people who moved to West Virginia to the low. Do you know about the low radio zone? Uh, no. In West Virginia? No. <laughs> oh, so there's. <laughs> There's an area in West Virginia that's this is some kind of like Luddite utopianism. Let's no, no, no. find let's find a geographical area that will block all the radio signals. That well, it's where there's big radio observatories. Control our minds, and they have they do radio experimentation there, so they don't allow you to use like the normally public bands are off limits. So you see. can't do cell phones, you can't do Wi-Fi, you can't do. So um, it's a natural dead zone. It's a natural dead zone. So okay. all the people that are like EM sensitive move to North West Virginia in the mountains. Huh? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the more you know. Yeah. Um, but anyway, anyway. Anyway, yeah. So, so this new standard will allow you to connect. Uh, my understanding is multiple devices at the same time. So not just two earbuds, but like you and I could be listening to the same Bluetooth right. stream from my phone, which is really cool. Right. Simultaneously. Like, yeah, that'd be nice for like airplane sitting on the airplane yes. and stuff like that. Uh, from a usability standpoint, that eliminates one of the things I hate the most about Bluetooth, which is having to manually swap between devices. Oh, right. Because, yeah, you have to you usually have to go in and disconnect one and reconnect right. like the other. Like I only have one pair of earbuds and I have them connected to my iPhone most of the time. But sometimes I want to use them with the MacBook and yeah. you have to go into some system settings and, and like mess with stuff every time you want to change it back and forth. Well, it, it, it's funny. That's one of those things. It's one of those reasons. Like, that's one of the things that made me get AirPods was when they started supporting Apple TV, mm-hmm. the AirPods on the Apple TV. And you can just sit with your AirPods in and listen to the TV and not bother the people in the room with okay, the TV. So they on. make all that stuff seamless. Yeah. You, you like long press the play button on the remote and it pops up a menu. It's like, hey, do you want to connect to Will's AirPods, Gina's AirPods? What, you know, what, what, yeah. what other devices? It's so really it sounds cool. like this is going to help automate a lot of that stuff, not having to manually fiddle with devices back and forth. That sounds good. Um, what else do they have here? So basically, that means like with this standard, both earbuds would connect directly to the phone. That seems nice. Yeah. So no, no so, beam through your right. brain. <laughs> right. okay. So there is that. Um, uh, they're uh, they're going to employ some kind of broadcast mode. I'm not sure how this would work in practice, but the example, basically, the idea. I mean, I guess this is a similar concept to what we were just talking about. But the idea is a single audio source could broadcast audio to numerous devices. Oh, no. Like a silent disco or... Kind of? Like the silent disco is the the techno hippie 
like positive outcome here. I right? guess so. Well, we, the example that they gave, which kind of actually seems sort of cool to me, is you could be in a sitting in an airport terminal mm -hmm. listening to music on your Bluetooth phones. Yeah. And an announcement relevant to your gate could go out and they could broadcast broadcast that to you. <laughs> You're closing your eyes right now. Like potentially that could be kind of cool to have like, you know, let, let me paint you the counterpoint relevant here. Relevant audio come in when you need to hear it. I'm wearing my AirPods as I walk down the street. Oh God. Uh, okay. You're right. From this Powell is, street to <laughs> your terrible. offices at second and, and Townsend. Yes. And you walk past Uniqlo or and I walk past Uniqlo and I hear Uniqlo music take over my AirPods. <sighs> and then I hear an ad for Banana Republic that says, right. Hey, if you come in right now and mention AirPods, you get 10% off. You're right. This is and terrible. then I just throw them in the drain and never wear a pair of. So, the, the, I mean, the thing wow. I couldn't, the thing I couldn't find information on is how that would, how you would authenticate with something like that. Probably, you yeah, know, it's just, it's, it's seamless, Brad. I would you hope, have to think about it. I would hope you would have to opt into something blink, like that. Blink to authenticate. Yes. Uh, oh, this doesn't sound good. Yeah. Um, they're uh, also there. I, I didn't quite understand how this works, but there's some kind of support for hearing aids. Oh, yeah. So there's this with the standard uh, modern hearing aids have Bluetooth. Uh, most most mid to high end hearing aids have Bluetooth built in. There's also a whole new FCC F. DA class of non prescription hearing aids that you can get. Okay. That do like um, selective selective audio boost in certain okay, ranges so this and stuff like that. Probably designed to uh, work with that. Somehow. Yeah. Yeah. So like having lower energy, since those hearing aids usually use disposable batteries, means that you'll get longer battery life out of one out of one of your disposable batteries, okay. which is a good thing. Uh, this is cool because I I have been wanting some better Bluetooth headphones for a while, but I'm also that curmudgeonly old fart that. Do you know, is always waiting for some better standard to come around. Do you know about so. the five dollar Alibaba AirPod, AirPod uh, yes, knockoffs? Yes, okay. we, we talked we about, about them, didn't we? Yeah, I, okay. I was never quite brave enough to buy any. Oh, it's time. I, maybe I should get get in there. Maybe I should. Yeah. Uh, can we talk about three sixty hertz G Sync monitors? Yeah. So this this came out of nowhere for me. Uh, um, Nvidia has been kind of slowly. At the same time, opening up higher frame rate non G Sync monitors to to use their to work on their cards, yeah. um, they've also been ratcheting up the speed that G Sync works at. So there were, I think, two hundred and forty or yeah. two hundred forty four hertz displays last year. Uh, are they on the market yet? Like I, yeah, you can buy those now. Okay, okay, but but it seems like the, even the two forty panels are just kind of really starting to become widespread. They were they were in a there was a. Asus or Acer or Dell, I can't. Yeah, like they're, they're one of the there. three common G Sync display vendors had yeah. one. Um, of course, I guess that you know CES doesn't mean that this product is ready to go on the market. It just means, hey, we have managed to achieve this. This means that well, so in this case, it means that they're. I think they're targeted at esports people, like yeah. not not people who are into esports, but people who are like esports players, like literal actual competing, yeah, com competitor it, 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 level types. It kind of seems like the equivalent of like Nike making. Uh, LeBron, his own custom shoes that he like for or or the, or the guy who ran the marathon in under two hours, making him a special pair of shoes. Sure. Um, so they they had Nvidia had some data that said, hey, we were seeing we we're seeing like thirty percent higher hit rates on flick shots. Okay. In in the handful of games that actually will run at 350 frames like, a second. Like that's the type of stuff I would like to hear more of. Like if there have been a lot of just straight up cognitive studies about how people process visual input so, so they brought in i think sensory. csgo and dota and maybe overwatch players yeah. and they were seeing they were seeing more accuracy like i'm so i'm in a weird spot with this because i've put you know three thousand hours into PUBG almost um and i can do i can do like i i'm i I might be wrong, but I feel like I'm playing like a pro PUBG player would have been playing like two and a half years ago, <laughs> okay. right? Like I'm I'm at that kind of okay. a pretty decent skill level, but not not anything modern and, and competitive. At, and, at, at what refresh do you game? Well, so I game at 60 hertz oh, right okay. now because I have an older 4K IPS oh. panel. Oh, I figured you were in some kind of high refresh. No, I need I, like it's becoming clear. Like I've reached a point where I feel like the refresh rate's actually holding me back. Mm. Like I can't, I can, I play with people who have 144 and 244 panels and they're able to see things like in cars because the higher refresh rate is reducing the blur the as blur. we're driving by. Yeah. So they're like, if we're going by at a hundred kilometers an hour, they can see that there's a dude in the window that I just see a blurry. They, yeah. They can make out a head and yeah. you just see a smear. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I'm curious to see. I, I talked to our friends at NVIDIA and we're going to see if I can get a chance to test these 360 wow, hertz panels. I would love to hear firsthand how um, how those things 
Yeah, I, I just want to see how they work. Yeah. I, I want to see if I can, like, I want to see if if this is a thing that I can detect the difference between a 144, or 240, and 360, or if it's if this is just going to be for like 22 year olds with god tier reflexes. Yeah. And you should be able to on on a single panel. You should be able to test all those side by side, right? I would think so. Yeah, yeah. that would be interesting. Um, it's also worth mentioning these are really esports panels. They're 1080p, like 24 inch panels. Oh, They're small panels. Wow. Yeah designed to be put into like competition spaces Im- image quality is not a priority here probably not it is just refresh probably just refresh rate um, um i gotta get one of those i mean i know we've talked about oh my, you haven't upgraded my, your monitors, my, my yeah, monitors for veils yes but like even if i go to like a press event somewhere to play a game on a nice high-end pc or something like just the windows desktop at a higher refresh is so much nicer if you don't upgrade like these just... by cs next year somebody's going to sell a foldable phone that is bigger than your desktop monitors okay uh, maybe i'll just um, mount one of those on the swing arm then. Did you see that big Samsung uh, monitor? The absurdly wide one? The absurdly wide one? Yes. Like the, it, lo- it looks like, um, what is the aspect ratio on that thing? I, it's, it's not, it's wider than 21.9. Um, that's, that's too wide. It, I, I agree. Uh, I'll, mainly because having tried to play games on a, on a 21.9 monitor for a long time, it was just always a hassle. Yeah. Like there was always something that like, if you're playing old games, it's no big deal because they usually patch that stuff in later. But um, it looked really pretty, and it supports high refresh rates, which I was surprised by. That's cool. Okay, what else we got? Um, should we talk about filmmaker mode? Which I feel like there's very little to say about, because it's kind of exactly what it sounds like. Well, actually, I don't know. I'm of two minds because what, I feel hold like on. yeah, we talked about the sun still entitled. This is oh, the thing. You? This is the thing where you where the where the TV looks okay. at the disc and is like, hey, this is a 24 hertz film. So I don't know how they're determining it, but one of the things they the TV makers are saying is that they do want it to be able to turn itself on automatically rather than the user having to toggle it on and off. This is the solution for the, this is, this hey, is for my Chris, phone's this, in soap opera mode. My TV's in soap opera This mode. is for Christopher Nolan. Yeah. And Martin Scorsese. Love that guy. And who else has been out there complaining about this? Uh, Tarantino, Tarantino uh, uh, John Favreau, I think, I think Ryan Johnson has been out there. Ryan Johnson seems like a huge, whatever, whatever every, yeah. every filmmaker on the planet hates motion smoothing on TV. <laughs> yeah. But look, everybody who enjoys watching TV that looks not like a soccer game, Yes. hates motion smoothing well, yeah. on TVs. But especially people who really get off on the uh, fine art of cinema. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, the point the point is clear. Like we have we have 4 th- 4K TVs that are capable of incredible gamuts and and like look spectacular, really good black levels the whole thing. And then people turn motion smoothing on and set them to the eye blaster. Yes. Eye blaster, I need to buy a new TV mode at Best Buy. Yeah. And it makes everything look like shit. And so it's not just motion smoothing. This mode is going to also disable any other sorts of post-processing yeah. the TV is doing. So any kind of like weird dynamic contrast stuff or tenting or, you know, things that would throw off just the tone of the image. Yeah. In addition to the motion. I'm uh, all for that. I think this is yeah, a great it's a, idea. It's, it's, yes, it's, it's a good thing to have. I, th- I don't know that filmmaker mode is the best way to present it mm. to people. I could see that being a little confusing. The, the thing that irks me and worries me about this is I play games and I watch films. And right now on my TV, I have to choose between game mode, which yes. enables the low latency stuff and like the THX good looking mode. I mean, again, once we, you know, once we're fully in our glorious HDMI 2.1 future and this is out there and working properly, like I'd, ideally it should just context to wear switch. Yeah. yeah. I, the, the way they're pitching this, you put in a UHD Blu-ray and it's the UHD like Alliance or whatever it's called that's yeah. pushing this. And specifically they're the ones saying like, Hey, we want this to work automatically rather than you having to toggle it. So yeah, ideally you would throw a 4k Blu-ray in it switches to filmmaker mode. You turn on your Xbox and play a game. It switches to game mode or low latency mode. Like what if you've ripped a 4k Blu-ray? Oh no, but you're playing it on your, and you're playing Xbox. it on your Xbox oh, no. with Plex. Oh no. The robots. Yeah. I don't know if the robots are going to be smart enough to figure that one out. Uh, turn off motion smoothing um, people. That's yeah. the TLDR for right now. Uh, it sounds like this will not be trickling down to existing TVs. Like this is something no, that will t- only be in. Yeah, uh, that makes sense. Uh, future models. So there's that. But and presumably it'll have to be supported by the player, the disc, and the TV. I guess so. Right. And I and I assume Apple and like the over the top set top box people will have something equivalent. Probably. Because usually this stuff rolls out with discs, yeah. the disc alliance. Okay, yeah, the, again, the, it's, the it's disc con- people are desperate to get yes. any kind of press they can <laughs> yes, at this point, they, honestly. I, I would believe that yeah. for sure. Can we talk about our stuff that isn't real section now? Sure. Sony is making a car. Well, they made a car. They licensed a car drivetrain. They produced a a single individual automobile. A concept I, car. I don't know that they're going to make any more. Like the Prowler. 
What's the Prowler? Do you not remember the Plymouth Prowler? Oh, uh, the best concept car of all time. It looked like a fifties roadster. Yes, with like, the one that looked super old timey. And it had like yeah. it had like the fenders on top of the wheels, and the fenders turned with the wheels, but the wheels were exposed otherwise. Was it purple? Purple. Yes, I do remember. And then it. they yes. turned that into the into the all time one of the worst car cars of all time, the PT Cruiser. Okay. Yeah. America's station wagon. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, the Vision S. Yeah. That's what the Sony's calling their is car. Is there a Z in there? Or is it an S? No, it's just an S. Boo. Uh, it's an electric car. I don't... What drives something like this? Uh, they have an R&D department that has to spend a certain amount of money each year or else <laughs> so, they lose their budget. I mean, that sounds like, if you're that technically minded, that sounds like a dream job, right? It's just get a giant budget and be told to go make something cool. I mean, what's the difference between a car and a drone at this point? Yeah, About 2,000 pounds. I guess so. I don't know. How do you feel about this thing? Like well, it, it feels like a fairly standard electric car from the sound of things, at least in terms of the actual driving of it. So the the first thing in the Verge article about this said uh, the company has no plans to mass produce the Vision hyphen S, the car it surprise announced at the end of the press conference at this year's Consumer Electronics Show, nor does it plan to do a limited run. So yeah. it's, it's literally a thing that they were like, hey, we can buy an electric right. car chassis and then make a showcase for all the ways that Sony Electronics can work inside your electric future right. like, electric like, car. Like when you lead off the pitch with, hey, we're never going to make any more of these. It's yeah. hard to get too excited about it. It's like when Microsoft used to do those home, they'd build yes. a fake home, at C- a fake house at CES, right. and they'd be like, this is what the home of 2010 is. And you'd be able to walk in, and you'd, they'd hand you a phone, and you'd see a video of Bill Gates playing on the phone. Bill right. Gates and The Rock would be playing on the phone. And then they'd, they'd tell you to hit a button on the phone, and it would start playing on the TV, and then it'd be on the wall behind the kitchen. And, and you know... You couldn't buy that house either. To be fair, they weren't weren't that far off. I mean, they nailed it. Yeah, they were exactly. Who knew? (laughs) It just took 20 years to get here. Yeah. Um, If you you, uh, pull up the inside, the photo of the inside of this thing, like the dash. Oh, yeah. It actually looks pretty fucking awesome. Have you been in a car that only has screens in the dash? Have you ridden Um, in a Tesla? uh, No, I've never been in a Tesla, but uh, so there are regular makes of cars out there now that are kind of getting there, I guess. I don't. Like we rent zip cars occasionally that okay. I'm occasionally impressed by how much of it is screen. So this is screen across the entire dash. I don't think I like there's I wrote about this attested years ago, but I feel like there's something beneficial to having tactile controls in a car where mm-hmm. you want to keep your eyes on the road. Yeah. As the cars get smarter and drive themselves more, that's less important. Mm-hmm. But this car very clearly still has a wheel and pedals. Yeah. A shifter. Um, what, would um, you, what would you say the. The aspect is on these screens they're very wide some of them look like they're like 30 to 1 yeah, 30, yeah 29 by it's, 1 so or basically like, like there there are basically three extremely wide screens across the entire dash of this car um and then instead of uh side mirrors they use cameras with two side screens the, you know i've often thought that the thing you really want to add <laughs> to your rear view uh your ability to glance at the space around you and see if it's safe to change lanes or move is, a, is some latency a, and, and potentially a point of failure <laughs> yeah uh, um the mirrors don't tend to stop working spontaneously i mean have you have you seen one of the cars that takes the cameras the wide angle cameras around the car and then builds a top-down picture of it for like when you're parallel parking so you can see it like shows you a picture of what the car looks like interesting so chevy bolts do this Uh and i think the i3 does maybe i can't remember but basically it it sensor fusions all these cameras and de-warps them and then builds a perspective correct top-down image of the car in the actual environment yeah not just like a representation. That's cool. So that you can see yourself backing in and stuff like that. I think that's maybe more useful than cameras in rearview mirrors. But is, is that presentation good enough that you could look just at that and, and parallel park effectively? It, it explicitly says not to do that. But yes, you can 100% look at just that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, I, this thing's cool. I mean, it's it's neat to look at and, and from a car of the future kind of standpoint. But, you know, again, it's not coming to market. So no, I mean, this is the like. I the interesting thing about this to me is that I think that this is probably indicative of what's going to happen with electric cars because they are close and like it sounds goofy to say but they're closer to consumer electronics in terms of mechanical complexity sure that you can like you could could just buy a drivetrain and like Apple could buy a drivetrain from Tesla and put their own chassis and their own electronics their own internal packages on that and and I I don't like, I don't think it's out of the question that there will be OEMs that just sell oh, interesting. electric car bits. Huh. Probably not to the point that, like, you can go to, you know, 
car part builder and right. part together like, your own car. You're not, not going to go on new egg and order a drivetrain. And yeah. Cause there's regulatory stuff that right. you would not be able to do. But like, I, I don't think it's out of the, like, like the number of moving parts in an electric car are really low. It's like electric motors, maybe some cooling for the batteries, heating for the batteries, uh, climate control and stuff for the central for the cabin, and then that's kind. Of, and then the 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 steering mechanisms and you, braking mechanisms. Do you think it could ever get to the point where like large parts of the car are made at stand like the uh, parts are standardized in terms of like size and and. Or do you think Ford and Toyota will have the same chassis specs so you can just pick like, a Ford like, chassis uh, off and bolt the. Wow. Like I'm really straining the analogy here, but what I'm actually thinking of is like the old school uh, head unit mm. for the sound system. The mini den. Right. Which yeah. is like all standard, right? Like that that plug and that size, that space, that slot is is a standard. Yeah. There's thing. standards for everything. Right. So I wonder if like electric wow. cars could get to the point where they're like you, you so simplified that you can just kind of mix and match parts. <laughs> like a PCI Express equivalent right. for car. Yeah, maybe I, I don't know. Anything's possible. Yeah. I mean, it makes there's there's something about making things to the same size so that all the parts are interchangeable that makes them much less expensive because, sure. you know, you you build one factory and you've built them all right. Sure. Uh, I don't know. I, I. I am conceptually very interested in this. Yeah. It's neat well, to think about real quick before we move on. I mean, you've been around the valley for years. Like I have. Is, is the Apple car has the Apple car ever been real to any significant I extent? Know. I like you've never heard any rumblings. I, so I have heard about the other things that have been rumblings. I've heard I, I know of people who are working on black box projects at Apple that go to work at Apple and then just disappear for like four years. Right. I don't know any of the I didn't know any of the car people well enough to know if they were car people that disappeared like that. Um, I know that there's like a bunch of AR and VR people that disappeared into Apple and haven't come back. So presumably, you know, th that indicates to me that Apple AR glasses are probably real. I, I wouldn't be in a position to know on cars. OK, because um, this really kind of came out of nowhere. Like it's like the TV. Remember, there was supposedly yes. Apple was making a monitor that was had an Apple TV built in. And then it turns out they just sell the software to LG and people who are in the TV like, yeah, I saw uh, like I, I feel like the, the TV announcements were pretty bland this year. It was a lot of very iterative stuff. Yeah, it was pretty predictable. But I did see a number of models that say they, quote unquote, have Apple TV in them. So that started that was one of the big things that came out last year mm -hmm. was Apple licensed to LG, Sony, Samsung, all the big vendors. Um, and they said, look, here's the hardware you have to have to provide something that's good, that, that's viable. And those TVs support air. Like my dad has a Vizio TV in his living room that supports airplay and you can get Apple TV. Like you can watch your iTunes stuff on it. So do you get a front end that looks like the front end on a real Apple TV at that point? No. So then your Apple, t the Apple TV becomes one store in your other front end. Okay. Um, but like airplay works any, like I, I you can airplay stuff from your phone, just okay. any, like, like any Apple TV. Okay. Yeah, it was. Um, I was surprised at how well that worked. Hmm. Yeah. Um, Samsung's eight terabyte external SSD. Let's see. I think that's SanDisk. Sorry, SanDisk. Samsung's got the other. Samsung one. made one with a fingerprint reader. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Eight terabyte SSD. I mean, it turns out you can make a SSD as big as you want <laughs> if you guess. own the if you design the boards and just keep slapping memory chips yeah. on there. And you call it a prototype and don't expect to actually sell it anytime you, soon. That seems like a twenty twenty one or twenty twenty two product. Mm. Maybe I late so. 2020. I think what is four terabytes still the biggest on the market or there might be six. There's probably stuff in enterprise. that's way bigger, but, but, but I mean, in terms of consumer for some, normal consumer, you can get your hands on and pay. you can, you can get four terabytes. The the sweet spot for price for price to size right now is two terabytes. It seems like, yeah, because you can get those for under 10 cents a t uh, gigabyte. Okay. Last I checked, I think a four terabyte SSD will still run you like $500. Yeah, that seems right. Um, that's still, I mean, that's look, uh, I, I feel like, I could live on a two terabyte drive as my primary computer right now, pretty comfortably. Yeah, sure. Without having even a spinning spinning disk, maybe. Yeah. I'd have to manage that. I you wouldn't install Call of Duty and Destiny at the same time. Probably not. Yeah. And you know, if you let's say you had some sort of network attached storage, perhaps yeah, that would make that a lot easier. Yeah. To not have a bunch of drives in your PC. Yeah. Um, I got excited seeing this because I am. Uh, your your dream. I'm very eager to get to a point where we can run a NAS with SSDs instead of platter drives, because mm. I feel like that is the biggest fear about long term data storage is having hard drives fail. So, and once you remove the mechanical failure aspect of that equation, it gets a lot less scary. Don't uh don't start ripping 4K Blu-rays then is my advice. <laughs> okay, because those are like 45 gigs each. Yeah, it's, even if you compress the shit out of them with H.265. Yeah, 
Um, but that just seems like we're getting closer to that. Probably, yeah. These SSD sizes, I feel like, are are really inflating rapidly. I mean, the 3D NAND stuff that Intel and Micron, I think, announced a few years ago is in full production now, and it seems to be really increasing density a lot. So, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, I think that stuff won't be on M2 drives, but that's fine because, like, for, for storage. Yeah, you don't need a, you don't need super high performance for just. Yeah. I'm fine plugging into SATA 6. Largely, largely static storage. How, about, how far off do you think we are from hard drives not really being widely available anymore? 10 years? I think that they'll continue to be important for data centers for a really long time. Okay. Uh, I, I, I don't I don't know what the state of the art on hard drive tech is. Like I know that they've they've pushed through limits, like theoretical max limits a couple of times by like doing things like changing the bits from a horizontal orientation per, you know, parallel with the platter to perpendicular to the platter. So they're because huh. you know the the actual turns out the actual bits have a three dimensional shape that's okay. kind of like it's kind of like a pill capsule. So you stand them on there, end, you can fit more of them on there. Yeah, you stand them on your end, you get way more in there. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, I feel like, I, I mean, I feel like the amount of data that we generate as a species requires spinning platters for a while. <laughs> Maybe so. <laughs> like, well, yeah. I mean, if you think about it, we've gone from generating a couple of petabytes a year to to thousands of exabytes a year over the last two decades. Do we really need to keep all of that. Well, I mean that's a larger question, but if you if you go through and start deleting my kid my baby pictures, I'm probably gonna be pretty upset with you, yeah, Google. That's fair. Okay, yeah. that's fair. Um, should we talk about this Intel GPU? Sure. This this I almost put this in stuff that isn't real. Yeah, because there's not a lot of detail to go on. Well, so it's called the uh, DG1. It's a discrete GPU. It's the second. So Intel about every decade. Does, goes through the hey we need to make a discrete gpu phase yeah. starting in like the late 90s post 3dfx yeah we talked about that a little bit on the ray tracing episode yeah uh they did larabee mm -hmm. in the middle 2000s now we're 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 back at it again <laughs> right on schedule we're right on schedule and um this this uh from what i can tell i read uh, gordon mong's article at pc world which seemed to be the best of the ones that i saw um he he said they didn't they, they they gave no details about what the internals are. All they said is it's it's basically the same GPU that's going to be in their ten nanometer CPUs, uh, presumably coming later this year. Yeah, that's Tiger Lake, I believe. Tiger Lake, yeah. yeah. So that'll be the like, you know, the next generation of like we're on you know ninety nine hundred now. Yeah, and that'll, this is this is ten X. However, people want to pronounce that the ten thousand ten nine hundred nine nine nine. Yes, yeah. wh whatever, whatever the next gen is. Um. And and so like as always with Intel GPUs, they run the same GPU core on each CPU die, and like the ones that are on you know ultra lightweight laptops has a very very small amount of space dedicated to that, and the one that's in a desktop processor has a lot of space dedicated to that. So you get varying performance based on the power requirements of the platform. But I, I think the goal with this with this uh, Tiger Lake GPU is to you, they're they're always trying to be competent at mass market for games. So things like Fortnite, uh, you know, in the old days they were always targeting Starcraft 2 and Minecraft and stuff like that. Now it's going to be Fortnite and Overwatch and um I don't know what do people play? What's what's the, what are the big multiplayer games? Probably uh, not PUBG because it's kind of a hog. Yeah. Um, um I'm trying to think what besides Fortnite and Overwatch like those kind of oh, are, Apex Legends probably. Apex, yeah. I mean it's, Minecraft's it's pretty still. lightweight. Um yeah, so, so maybe Siege, stuff like that. Sure. Stuff that people play yeah. in large quantities. Yes. Um, do you have a sense of like, does the GPU in a, in a 9900K right now run Fortnite acceptably well? I only know about that in terms of what you can do on VR. Okay. Cause I, cause like I've, I'm always looking for a smaller, lighter laptop that will run VR so I can do demos. Um, none of the Intel GPUs have run VR stuff so really? okay. with any reliability. So it's still a ways to go then. This, I mean, one of the things that I was told early on with this, this generation of GPUs is that they were targeting VR. Okay. So min, min spec VR, um, so, you know, things that were run on your, Ocu on your Oculus with a 970, uh, type graphics card. So, which, which also opens the door to pretty much everything that ships for PS4 and Xbox one, sure. um, stuff like that. So like, it's, it's, I mean, potentially interesting. This is the developer board. Yeah. Like I was going to ask, I mean, does this even read to you? Like this is going to result in an, 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 on the shelf. I would be shocked. PCIe card. No, this is, they're giving this to developers so that they have, so that they have them in the pipeline early enough that people can be aware 
and like put this into their testing huh. for games that are upcoming. Okay, so uh, Intel graphics cards right next to AMD and NVIDIA not going to happen anytime soon. I would be surprised. On store shelves. I mean, th- look, the reason they do this is because they don't have the CPUs ready to ship now. Okay. And oh, it's, so, okay. it's, it's probably, just a development sample, basically. Yeah, it's it's cheap. Well, if you think about it, it's cheaper for everybody. Like, if I'm a developer, I don't want to have to spin up an extra... Like, if they send me a motherboard and a, and a CPU, I'd much rather have just a video card I can drop into one of the other 45 million test machines I have. Sure. Um. So, yeah. All right. So, maybe nothing to get super excited about. I, I don't think it's... Uh, I would be very surprised if these are on short shelves in Best Buy. The one thing that was interesting out of this, though, is that they're talking about potentially letting you use integrated and discrete together. So maybe they will ship one as yeah, like, a, I saw, I think it was Tom's hardware was speculating about that. Oh yeah. But, then, okay. never mind. <laughs> <laughs> huh. Ooh, sorry. Tom's hardware burn. Some speculation I saw. Yeah. That like, well, but again, that would require you to have to have an extra have card. one of these cards. Yeah. And that may not happen. So yeah. Who knows? Um, it's weird to bring a product to CES and barely say anything about it, but well, but you got to get the develop, like you got to get out for developers. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah like, sure. like this is the, the, Sorry, they spend the consumer electronics. They spend a lot of money on those booths, no, so I they got to have yes, some I stuff know. that gets yes. press. Developer outreach is important. Yeah. Yes, Intel is one of the last of the huge like PC companies that's still there. Really? Yeah. Because like Microsoft hasn't been at CES oh. in, a de- in five years, no seven kidding. years, something huh. like that. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. This it used to be Intel and Microsoft were right next to each other, and then Microsoft went away, and then it's always been like some Chinese TV company or phone company or something oh, wow. there. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Um, is AMD there or, or did this I think they just, just happen do, around it? They often they may be there. I don't know. Uh, like I saw an interview from uh, their, their CEOs, Lisa Sue. Is that right? Yes, that's um, correct. She was saying that the Zen 3 stuff is going to be out there this year. What is Zen 3? Brad? Zen 3 is the next. Uh, we talked about it last week. It's their next generation micro architecture uh, uh, for, for, for CPU. For CPUs. Yeah. All, all the current Ryzen chips are on Zen 2. Yeah. So it's the um, chiplet design and all that stuff, right? Right. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's like the internals of the chip itself, the you know the logic and how it processes instructions and stuff like that. It's interesting. The rumors, well, real quick, the rumors, and again, these are rumors, who knows how valid they are, but they were saying that on an instruction per clock basis, they're going to be performance gains of like 15 to 20% with the Zen oh, 3 wow. stuff, which is big. Yeah. That's a big deal. Yeah, that's um, that's like in terms of... Uh, especially for games, because my understanding is the games are still not as multi-threaded as you might think they no. should be at this point. Well, so and does that mean they're doing go, a deeper pipeline? I don't know. I didn't read okay. into like where those gains are coming from. Huh. Um, that's it. That's it. It sounds very substantial. Well, so the, the thing that's interesting about AMD is usually the places that they've really blown up and had massive success, like with the original Athlon and the K6 and stuff like that, are when Intel hits the limits of a process technology. Because Intel Intel's, Intel's secret sauce is, hey, we're just going to make it smaller right. and use less power and then make it faster. Um Whereas AMD is often like being more parallel or doing more instructions per clock or whatever. Yeah. And like Intel is reaching the the 10 nanometers is, is approaching the end of what we can do with process tech as we understand it right now. Um, well, most everybody else is on seven now. Well, right? I mean, Intel's deliberately been slowing their, their push I, down. I see. Yeah. Do they, they do all their own fabrication? I believe so. Okay. I believe they own their own fabs. That maybe has something to do with it. Hmm. I mean, yeah, but if like TSMC has seven nanometer fabs, then Intel will have seven nanometer fabs. They might just be using it for something. They might be using it for enterprise or something else where there's like more money than consumer market. I, I don't know about that. Uh, the the thing I was going to say is that the yeah, the, like AMD is in a position where with their chiplet design, moving away from the monolithic chip has given them a big advantage in flexibility and like binning, so they can get they can put more of the more performant chips cores on on one chip and that gives them a big advantage what are i'm trying to think like outside of like the workstation context like what are some consumer oriented workloads that a, a cpu with that many threads video and relevant to yeah i mean um, even even that is not really consumer level um i mean i don't know everybody does a performance level well like like streaming i mean i guess the classic example is like hey you can run a game and stream it at a high bit rate and not feel any and not have to do two pcs like that. or yeah let's say you're running handbrake every night crunching a bunch of blu-rays or something like there yeah. are some applications for it but like it's some it, of these some of these super high-end thread rippers it's just like I, I can't think of a use case for that on a on a home desktop well but so if you do if you're like a photographer it's, it's all it's going to be for niche home use yeah right it's going to be people who are into making videos or people who are into doing animation or people who are into uh like photography even like if you look at the math that happens on like the denoising algorithms and stuff like that that you run on a modern uh even on like a dslr photo those are those are intense. Sure. I mean, it'll take a while to run them on 10,000 photos. 
like right now, a lot of video houses workload for like people who do YouTube videos and stuff like we do, like you do a giant bomb is you, I mean, you guys don't do a ton of edited stuff, but when you do edited stuff, there's a, there's a moment where you walk away and hit the oh, yeah, button yeah. and you walk away for an hour. Massive amount of render time. Yeah. And then you come back and it's done. Yeah. And if that hour goes to 25 seconds, right? Yeah. That's a big deal. Yeah. But again, that's not a, that's not a, a, a an end user or like a home application necessarily. That, that's what I was getting at. Yeah. I don't, like I mean, outside, I don't, outside of like heavy media work, I can't think of a lot of reason for the average person at home to, I don't think there has to be a, to, to, to need 32 cores. No, but there, I mean, there isn't. Look, do we need eight cores? No, <laughs> we need two cores. Really, mm-hmm. most people. Sure, four is nice. Yeah, yeah. I, I like. I don't. I think. I think we're at a point now where the hardware is out there, and it's up to developers yeah. to figure out what to do with it. Sure. So that's fair. I mean, I think we're going to see a lot of that with the next console generation too, since they have eight cores now. Yeah. Um, well, these current ones have eight ish or like seven, I think. Yeah, but they but, were. But they're crappy network they were, CPUs that. Yeah, 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 they were low. They were low yeah. capability. Yeah. Like the ones and the new ones are like actual real big boy CPUs. Um, you think? I think that's probably. I mean, hey, Sony unveiled the PS5 logo. They sure did. Looked like a logo. Mm-hmm. It looked like just like the PS4 logo, but with a five instead of a four. I don't know about that choice of five. To be you honest, think so? I don't know if they've had this font that they've been sitting on for twenty five years, and that, that this is just just the time for the five to shine. I thought they should have made the five look like the backwards S. Right. That's kind of how I was, I was feeling hoping. that it was a little bit too. The angular I, it doesn't look, fit brad but. i think we should shut down the podcast we should open a branding design studio <laughs> right. consulting studio yes. look it's it, everything looks weird when you see it the first time in yeah. like three months we're not going to notice anymore yeah. yes you're going to do some predictions for 2020s or you feel oh, like I uh sure i was i was thinking about this because you suggested this the other day and i was like man there's so much i was look, i just looked around my office and i was like there's 15 things in here that i i never could have predicted beat saber yeah in 2010 yeah I never even thought VR would be real in 20. Like, I didn't think I didn't think there was any chance we would see anything like VR in 2010. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, Gosh, like, what are the big trends right now? Space going to space is getting cheap. I guess so. Yeah. VR seems to be leading to AR. Yeah. I feel like the, the public private split on space. I, I hesitate to call it space exploration, but it's more like space industry, I guess. Yeah. Like, I feel like that balance hasn't been figured out yet. No, like, not we're at still, all. We're still in the formative stages of like, oh, private companies are doing what the government is not willing to fund right now. Well, except for the government is also funding them. But then, yes, they're because, still getting, yes. You know, like SpaceX is number one contractor. Oh, I know. Yeah. 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 Um, so for me, like if you could spend 50 grand and that would take you, that would give you a couple of orbits. I don't know, man, that's a lot of money, (laughs) but you get to go to space. What if you get, what if you go to 50 grand, you could stay there for two weeks, Mm. have a little vacation, maybe go to the space beach. Sure. I I don't know. I'm, I'm really, I'm really kind of up in the air uh, on, on the future of a lot of stuff. Like I, I I feel pessimistic about the coming decade. (laughs) Well, okay. So. There was a thing that came out last week. We didn't talk about it, I don't think. Um, but it was about uh, sulfur. Somebody figured out how to make sulfur diodes in lithium batteries, which increases the capacity for energy storage a lot. But it's okay. been challenging because the sulfur anodes um, shrink and contract like 70% in the course of charging and discharging. And that makes the battery structurally unsound, which is problematic. I think I think we're going to see... We've seen enough of these like theoretical breakthroughs that haven't turned into real breakthroughs that I think probably one of them will hit and is manufacturable in the next decade. Sure. So I think, yeah. I think the idea of... I think in 10 years, the idea of plugging your phone in to charge every night is going to seem quaint. I could, yeah, I could definitely see that. Yeah, like, yeah, I could, I could. I'm sure there will be some pretty major. There's, like, a, there's a prediction right low, there. Low level tech breakthroughs that will change. People, I also think lifestyles in positive ways. I also think that HP HP is into WebOS for the long haul. Okay, I think they're going to bring that back, huh. and we're going to see. This is going to be the decade that WebOS starts to challenge iOS you, and you Android. Still to this day, hear a lot of people say glowing things about WebOS. Um, I, mean, I had a touchpad. It's the it's the it's I on still, every it's, I LG TV. I still have a touchpad around here somewhere. Yeah. It's got WebOS on. Great piece of Hardware. right now um, um it's it's web os drives lg tvs mm, yeah okay still out there in some that's form. that's my number two prediction um I, I i think the main thing i felt pessimistic about is the potential for widespread and convincing digital fakery i think that's a real problem like that's the thing i'm worried about maybe more than anything i think the fact the, that major social platforms have come out and said hey we are fine with political ads that use deep fakes we're not going to ban those yeah well that i mean that that's, that's just, problematic that's just pure policy you know, I'm talking more about like um, like deep fake stuff becoming well. well I think the alarmingly problem, effective. I, I here's a prediction. I think that the twenty this next decade is going to be defined by policy slamming up against techno technology. Okay, sure. I think yeah. that's going to be the big. 
more than technological progress, I think figuring out how this interacts with society in a way that doesn't destroy society is going to be really important. Yes, <laughs> that's probably a safe bet. Um, yeah, it made me wonder if like there will be a, I don't know, some kind of large scale investment in like green technologies or specifically technologies that designed to counteract kind of the existing forces. You mean like play? anti like carbon, like carbon sinks? Yeah, yeah, stuff like that. Uh, but that. You know, that obviously depends on which way the political winds are blowing. Well, what was it? There was a there was an article a couple of weeks ago that was like, look, if we spent six hundred billion dollars on this right now, we could solve this problem right. in the next ten years. Yes. Or which would involve taxing the top one percent an extra two percent or something. Mm, it's yeah. Tough, tough, tough to choices, yeah, really. Really got to weigh the it's pros, impossible to decide. Pros and cons of that one. Um I think uh, I think we're probably going to see AR glasses as a real thing oh, in the next uh, decade. I saw, uh, I think it was Panasonic brought a pair of VR glasses to CES. Oh, the goggles? The yeah, ones they, that look like goggles? They look like steam, like futuristic steampunk goggles, but, but my understanding is they are standard VR. So those were for commercial use, right? I'm not sure. They're not, they're not consumer product. I think, I think it may have been a prototype. Yeah. They're, not, they're not on the market. So no. I've seen goggles like that in the past that were like hand-built prototypes. <laughs> The problem with those that don't have the the unified hole is getting the FOV right so it doesn't feel yeah, like you're the, looking this, down a tube. The, the write-up did say that they had a very limited field of view compared to yeah. the actual headsets on the market. Yeah. Um, um, and whereas we've seen the FOVs getting wider and wider, um, I, I, I think we're going to see on the VR front, I think that in the next couple of years, VR is going to very much be a hybrid you know, headset with a standalone processor that also can tether... I mean, we already see that with the Quest, but the Quest isn't super comfortable. Yeah. Um, I think we'll see with the 5G, 6G wireless, we'll see some more wireless implementations of that that makes it a little more feasible. All right. Well, uh, here we are. It's a new decade. What's So your prediction's just doom and gloom? It's all over? Know. Carbon it's, sinks? Yeah, pretty much. You gotta have something better than I, that. I saw, I saw an article. I wish I had saved it because I wasn't able to go back and refer to it again, but there was an article the other day about services coming online that can basically, like, the example they gave was they can effectively use AI or machine learning or whatever it is to generate, let's say, like, uh, photographs of fashion model with any combination of, like, gender and ethnicity that you want. And they had a straight up spread right there of the exact same photograph, just like, oh, yeah, boom, 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 boom down the line. Well, just like one one generated face after another. And they were completely convincing. And it just like, again, you know, the the potential for political ramifications and the spread of misinformation and stuff based on that sort of thing is just kind of horrifying. Have we talked about the virtual influencers here yet? No, this is an Asia thing right now, oh, but they're trying to make it happen here. So Hatsune Miku is kind of the prototype, yeah. but, but she's a vocaloid and right. not necessarily... Um, the virtual influencers are... Uh, oh, you like the ones that are presented as actual humans, like that have Instagram accounts? And yeah. Are and they're just owned visual, by some visually, studio. Or, visually indistinguishable from real people? Yeah. Yes, I, I, I have seen some of that yeah. stuff. Yeah, it's a nightmare. Yeah. Yeah. So there you go, 2020. It's a nightmare. Dismantle social media. I think that's probably a good idea. <laughs> it's my platform. I am... Um, I, I've been... I've I've had a I've been working on a bot for Twitter for a while that's like a block all brands bot. So you just sign up for it and you hook it up to your Twitter account, and then it automatically block, blocks all brand accounts. That seems good and necessary. Yeah, it seems like it's a good thing. I yeah. don't know. Yeah. Anyway, Jerry. Uh, yeah. What's, uh, <laughs> Sorry to kick the decade off on the wrong foot. Uh, uh yeah, yeah, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> everything seems like it's going to be great, Brad. Yeah. Let's keep our fingers crossed. Um, we'll be back next week with another. Uh, episode of Brad and Will made a tech pod. Uh, we'll do questions and probably not next week, not the week after, but the week after that, maybe something like that. Every three or I'll every four or five you. You weeks. Yeah, it's well, our podcast. Yeah, we, we can do whatever we can we do want. whatever all we want. Yeah. Um, next week we're gonna do questions, no answers. It's just we're gonna read questions <laughs> we're for gonna, two hours. We're gonna ask you questions. Yeah, we want to know what you guys know. Yeah. So there's a quiz. Yeah. Um, if you like the show, please tell your friends about it. That's the best way to let other folks know. Um, tweet at you know facebook use all the social medias that brad hates <laughs> to spread the word please only use them for good though. you want to get a sweet face tattoo that has like brad's face on my one side and oh, my God. face on the other wow probably don't do that that's but brand, if you do send us a picture that's brand loyalty yeah um we'll be back next week with more tech pod thanks for listening everybody mm-hmm.